It is so good to see you this morning. Look at your neighbor this morning and tell them, say, I don't know what it is about the, what you're wearing this morning, but you look 12 pounds lighter than you did Sunday. <laughs> Some of you saying now, we're not supposed to lie in church, hey. If you tell me, I receive it. I receive it. 12 pounds. I tell my wife, looky there, I told you I was losing weight. My neighbor said so. So, but anyway, man, I'm one of those that preach and talk, teach with my hands, and this microphone is like, psh, Yeah. We need to uh, take up a love offering and invest in a tie mic. Boy, it got quiet there talking about money. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not going to pass the offering plates. So kind of reminded me of a story of these uh, two little boys. They were riding their bicycle. <clears throat> he said, what are you doing? I'm still trying to figure out what to do, so stick with me. Uh, don't want to do anything that's not what God wants me to do, so we're kind of we're kind of just listening. But it reminds me of a story of these two little boys. They were riding their bicycle down through the uh, neighborhood, and they come across this uh, graveyard. Well, they got tired, so they all stopped under a big tree on the other side of the fence and said uh, they was there and said all of a sudden they heard something over in the graveyard, and it's saying, uh, one for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. And so the little boys, they peeked around and got to look and couldn't see nothing, but they kept hearing those two voices, one for you, one for me. Well, after about five minutes, little Johnny got scared to death, got to crying. His brother said, what's wrong with you? He said, I'm going home. He said, God and the devil's over there and said they're separating souls out, one for you, one for me. So... That was pretty good. That was funny right there. I don't care who you are. That was funny. Acts chapter 28 if you have your Bibles. The pastor, I really appreciated. He gave me five days notice. I know, right? Five days. I about fell out of the rafters when he told me. He said, and he actually said it too. He was like, hey, uh, aren't you glad? Are you surprised I gave you five days? Yeah, because normally it's like five minutes. <laughs> but, you know, it says be instant in season and out of season. So if you come here and you talk, preach, or teach, you better be ready because he's subject to call on you at any point in time. But in the book of Acts, chapter number 28, this morning, we've experienced just a little bit of it through praise and worship. How many of you appreciate the praise and worship band? I mean, it is <clears throat> phenomenal, phenomenal. I've preached from North Carolina to Alabama to Florida, all over the southeast, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not saying it because they belong to our church, but one of the best bands that I've ever heard. And not only are they talented musicianally, but they're anointed. And that's, that's the big part. They're anointed. So, but in the Acts chapter number 28, we're going to be talking to you this morning. And normally I get a little fired up and, and, and I try to calm down. And I can't get calm because I'm talking about God and I get excited and I turn purple and spit and jump and hoot and holler like an old bull in a china shop. So this morning, I'm going to try to slow down just a little bit. And if it don't work, then it don't work. But in uh, chapter 28 of Acts, verse number 1, the Bible said, And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita, or Malta in some translations. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us, every one, because of the present rain and because of the cold. If you have a pen, circle that word cold. We'll come back to it. Verse number three, And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, 
whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire. Somebody say, into the fire. Into the fire. And felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. They changed their minds. Isn't that funny how people change their minds? They want to work. I can't go there. They want to worship God, Chad, but then they change their minds. They want to come to church, but then they change their minds. They want to love God, but then they get around people and they change their minds. They, they don't cuss at church on Sundays, but then they cuss on Monday. They change their minds. You don't have to amen. It's okay. I'm a big fella. I can take it. Verse number seven, in the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days. Now, if you can't shout about anything, you ought to be able to shout that your mama didn't name you Publius. <laughs> and it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed. Verse 10, who also honored us, we talked about honor in Sunday school, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they lighted us with such things as were necessary. Now, to give you just a little background, right quickly, for sake of time, right quickly, verse number 27, we see that Paul and, and, and others were on a ship. They were sailing. A great storm came up, and we see that they tried everything in their means to get the boat to steer, get the boat to sail. But with failure, the boat was taken on water. The storm, the boat was starting to break apart, and the boat was overtaken. The Bible said that they aimed it, they saw the island, they aimed it, and they let it drive towards the island. And when they were shipwrecked, and the reason why I had you to circle that word Melita or Malta was if you study that word out, it simply means sweet as honey. And when they had a shipwreck here in chapter 27, they landed on an island that was sweet as honey. Now, some of you have went through, how many of you have ever had a shipwreck in your life? I've had shipwrecks. Some of you have lost your job, but there's honey on the way. Some of you have gone through a divorce, but there's honey on the way. Some of you have been addicted, but there's honey on the way. Some of you this morning don't know whether you're going left, right, straight, up or down. You're confused as a two-headed woodpecker in a yo-yo. But there's honey on the way. That's trademark too. You can't use that. 27, they shipwrecked. 28, the fire's built. So the book of Acts... In chapter 1, we see that in chapter 1, the church is assembled. The church is manifested. The church becomes the church in Acts chapter 1. They were first called Christians at Antioch. Close. <laughs> they were first called Christians in Antioch. The church was formed in the book of Acts chapter 1. Jesus in chapter 1 rises in the clouds in chapter 1. Chapter 2, the fire comes down in the day of Pentecost. Now we zoom back over to chapter 28, and from chapter 1 to chapter 28, we're still talking about the fire. All throughout the Bible, we talk and we read and we study about the fire of God. Let me tell you something this morning. We see pictures of angels and pictures of little cherubims wearing diapers, playing harps, and floating on clouds. My God is not some limp-wristed God that is up there in fairyland, but my God is a God of fire. Amen. 
The book of Acts ushers in the early church gives us a view of the development and the birth of the church. The church was born, I'm going to give you a precept and then we're going to get into the message. The church was born wild and raw and authentically uh, hungry for the things of God. When the early church was born, it was born on a promise from God. They were operating in obedience to the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word and the word was There you go. Jesus told the, the, uh, the people to go to a hill and there standing on the hillside was 500 people and they heard him say, tarry in Jerusalem and wait until you are endued with power from on high. 500 people according to 1 Corinthians heard this but only 120 people lasted long enough to receive the fulfillment of the promise. My question is, where did 380 go? They fell by the wayside. You say, why? Because everyone catches the promise. Come on now. Everyone catches the promise as it's spoken, but not everyone receives it because they don't prioritize their lives in a way to be in the room when the fire of God falls. Oh, my. I wanted to preach something happy and peppy this morning. That's because you've already heard it once. <laughs> People build their lives around everything. They build it on their careers. They build it on their homes. They build it on their cars. They build their lives on their family. They build their lives on everything etern or, or, or existing here. We need to have the mindset as children of God that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Bible said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. The 120 were all in the upper room and they were in one mind and one accord. When suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where they were sitting and cloven tongues, cloven tongues like as of fire sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, you can say something about God wanting to bless you financially and people hang out of the rafters and hang off the light fixtures, but you... Well, you speak about the Holy Ghost and everybody gets quiet. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God is the power that endues and brings fire from God. Well, I was brought up in this denomination and they said that, you know, the Holy Ghost, blah, blah, blah. I don't care what they said. I'm just here to tell you what the Bible says. And as long as it lines up with this word, because he said, my word will not return void as long as it lines up with the 66 books from Old Testament to New Testament that's in this Bible, then I'm going to choose to believe what this Bible says and not what some guy wearing a dress with his collar turned around backwards. You call him father, but he dresses like mama. I'm just going to choose to listen to what God has to say. Boy, you offended me. I get offended every day. I wake up and look in the mirror and I've gained 40 pounds. I'm offended every day. The fire doesn't fall only on the preacher. The fire of God doesn't fall on the preacher, doesn't fall just on the pastor, doesn't fall just on the teachers. The Bible said it was cloven tongues of fire and it sat on each of them. So we see if the 500 would have actually went with the, or the 380 would have went with the 120, which would have made 500, if they would have went in one mind and one accord, all 500 would have had it. But because they chose not to go and they chose not to be around the fire and they chose not to trust God with what God had told them, they missed out on the miracle. Let me tell you something, there's a flame from God that only has your name on it. It won't fall on me, it won't fall on the pastor, it won't fall on the teachers, it'll only fall on you because it's got your name on it. 
There is a fire that will only burn on your head. There is a move of God that is coming to you. There is a fresh Pentecost for you and your walk and you, and you don't have to go through some dead, dry, religious, spiritual movement to get it. You can find it in the fire of God. Talk about fire, the Holy Ghost fire of God in churches and people start getting nervous. They start getting squeamish. They start packing up, packing up their pocketbooks and, and nudging their honeys and saying, hey, the chicken's getting cold at the buffet bar. And they start looking at you like you're crazy. The fire of God is a subject that we don't talk about much. And when we do, we tiptoe around it. We wear white gloves and we use hand sanitizer so we don't catch it or get too close to it. God, according to the book of Hebrews, is not a God of smoke. He is not just a passing cloud but he is a consuming fire. In fact, if you look throughout the Bible in every major development and in every division, you will find the fire of God. It was the fire of God that fell between the sacrifices of Abraham. It was the fire of God that led the children of Israel by night and a cloud by day. It was the fire of God in Leviticus chapter 9 that fell on the altar when they put the sacrifice on the altar. And the Bible said the fire of God fell from heaven. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we read that the prophet stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with 450 prophets of Baal and the entire nation of Israel was in a division and doubt and illusion and Elijah stood on the Mount Carmel and God and said, if God, God is, uh, if, if your God is, if Baal is God, then let him, let us serve him. But if God be God, then we'll serve him. But let the God that answers with fire... Let him be God. And the Bible said that he prayed some massively long, hour-long prayer. No, the Bible said he prayed a prayer that took up uh, two chapters in the Bible. No, the Bible said that he prayed a 63-word prayer. And in 63 words of praying to God, the Bible said that heaven came, heaven opened up, the fire came down and it was so hot that it licked up the water that had been poured in the trenches and burnt the sacrifice on the altar. The fire broke the people loose from religious boundaries, witchcraft, confusion and all their burdens. I'm going to come out in the crowd and amen myself. But that's not the only place I find the fire of God. Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet was depressed. And he was ready to quit. He was tired of preaching because every time he turned around, preaching got him in trouble. Amen. You be evangelist. See, the pastor gets up and he cleans up after the evangelist comes in and tears everybody apart. Jeremiah was tired of preaching because every time he got in trouble, the Bible said that Jeremiah ran into a cave and he said, I'm going to give up preaching. I'm not going to open my mouth anymore. But he said, but when I got alone and got silent and got still in the cave, I found something going on down on the inside of me. He said, it, he said I felt the word of God like a fire shut up in my bones. If you've ever been touched by the fire of God, you may walk away from God, you may turn your back on God, you may uh, uh, fall into divers, whatever, but I'm here to tell you, if you've ever experienced a true fire of God, it will be like a fire shut up in your bones and you won't be able to run forever. Well, that's just all in the Old Testament. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. We'll come out of the Old Testament and we'll flip through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And here comes a long-haired Galilean with sandals and the Bible said that he is standing there at the Jordan River. 
And John looks and sees, and John the Baptist said these words, I'm not worthy to latch the latchels on his shoes. He said, I baptize you in water, but there, there's one coming after me that will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. And it was Jesus that said that I come to set the world on fire. You may think that based on that, that this is the end of fire. But if you turn over to the book of Revelations, chapter number two. Woo! This is, I mean, my hairs are growing. John the Baptist is left, <laughs> woo! John the Baptist is left on an island called Patmos for dead. Nobody was there to pat him on the back and tell him what a good job he is doing. Nobody was there shaking his hand saying, Brother John, oh, you're so good. Uh, nobody to say amen. And nobody was there to be his friend. But I'm here to tell you, the Bible says that John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Good God Almighty, I feel him up here. And from behind him, he heard a voice. And it said, Behold, John, I am Alpha and Omega, uh, the the beginning and the end. I am he that was and is and is to come. And John turned around to see who it was that was talking to him. And John said, when I turned around, I wasn't ready for what I saw. He said, I saw feet like brass. I saw eyes like fire. And he was, uh, and he had a voice that sounded like many waters. Hey, I'm here to tell you, honey, hey, if you hear the voice of God, you turn around and you won't be be expecting what you see but he'll be there and he is the fire that will illuminate your dark valley yeah. Acts chapter 1 he steps on a cloud and he ascends Acts chapter 2 the fire falls and here we are today in the last chapter of Acts and we're still talking about the fire before we get into the message, let's look at the blessings in chapter number one. They were in a horrible shipwreck and they had landed on the island of Malta or if you're in the King James, Malita. And now that doesn't seem important, but Malta means sweet like honey. I'm thankful that if you're going to shipwreck, praise God, that God can turn a disaster into something sweet like honey. Amen. How many today has been through a shipwreck? We've already answered that. How many can testify that it was the shipwreck that led you to the place of unfavorable mercy? How many of you can say if it hadn't been for the shipwreck, I wouldn't be where I'm at today? Had it not been for the shipwreck, I wouldn't be the person I am today. The shipwreck brought them to a place that was sweet like honey. And if it hadn't been for the shipwreck and disasters in your life, no telling where you'd be. i tell you where I'd be. I'd probably be sobering up this morning. Or better yet, I'd probably be in hell burning this morning. But thank God through the disasters and the shipwreck of my life, I gave my heart to Jesus. And through my faults and through my failures and through my mistakes, hey, he still loved me, he still cared about me, and he still found me worthy to be called the child of God. That may not excite some of you, but I'm just here to tell you that'll make a wet Methodist shout right there. I want you to understand <laughs> that that's patented too. I want you to know something this morning. Now, now listen, if I say something this morning, don't get mad at the preacher, get mad at me. Okay? He takes enough, so don't go bashing on him. You come to me. We, so anyway, we'll pray about it. <laughs> Listen here. That shipwreck led you to a place of unusual favor. I want you to understand something this morning. If you've went through something drastic in your life, a divorce, addiction, pornography, adultery, Whatever it is this morning, I want you to understand something. Hey, you can go through a shipwreck and recover. You can go through a shipwreck and recover. I know some of you, like I said, may have lost your job. 
but the Lord is going to take you to a sweet place. I know some of you this morning, you're battling with lust, addiction, pride, greed, adultery, lack of value, and so much more, but you're about to land in an island of sweet place. Paul and those that were shipwrecked on the island were wet. They were scared. They were cold. But the people on the island built them a fire. We live in a day and age of cold and stormy times. We live in a time and a day and age where people are mean. They hide behind a username on the computer and they bash you and they talk about you and they try to tell you what you are and what you are not or they hide behind a phone number and a telephone texting you. But let me tell you something. We're living in a day that when the Bible says the love of many will wax cold and people are meaner and meaner and eviler and eviler. That word is patented too. Well, what do we do, preacher, if people are doing that? We let the fire of God stay on us and we block them. Let me try this side. We let the fire of God fall on us, stay on us, and we block them. Take notes. We see here that fire needs three things to burn. And I'm going really fast now. Fire needs three things to burn, grow, and consume. You need fuel, oxygen, and an ignition point. You need fire will double in size every minute it burns. You say, how do you know that? Because I was a fireman for about 15 years, and I went through the fire academy. Firefighter 1, Firefighter 2, I got the whole, all the certificates to prove it. Fire will double in size every minute it burns if it has fuel, oxygen, and an adequate space to burn. Fire will double in size. Without a fire, things can sneak in and damage the fuel from the inside out. You ever went to put a log on a fire and the log looked pristine on the outside, but when you pick it up, it crumbles because on the inside it was rotten? In the last days, they'll seek unto themselves teachers having itching ears, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Not everybody that totes a Bible, not everybody that preaches, not everybody that teaches is actually doing it for the right reasons. Well, I don't go to church because there's hypocrites in church. No, but you'll go to Walmart. <laughs> Think about that. Brother Brian, I'd rather come to church with hypocrites than to go to hell with them. Now, if we're going to do this now, I'm trying my best. This is a first for me. We're going to have to click it. There we go. Fire has to have fuel. We see that Paul gathered sticks in verse number three. Sticks or fuel comes in four. Well, okay, nope. Yep, that's it. Man, I don't even need glasses. Paul gathered sticks in verse 3. Sticks or fuel comes in four ways. It comes through prayer, comes through worship, comes through your giving. But lastly and most importantly, it comes from your heart being all on the altar. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Every time you pray, you're gathering sticks. Every time, preacher, you ever just felt like when you said, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to fast this coming week. And you ever felt like somebody looked at their neighbor and said, hey, he's talking to you, not me. <laughs> Every time you pray, you're gathering fuel for the fire. Every time that you worship or you praise, you raise your hands and you give God honor, you're gathering fuel for the fire. 
Every time that you give tithes, oh, there he is about money. Listen, if money bothers you that much, keep it. Money by God don't need your money, and if it bothers you that bad, keep it. God will take care of the church. Amen, preacher. <laughs> I want you to see something here. Good night. I want you to see something here. The Bible said that when Paul and his men got there, they, it was raining and it was cold. So the people built a fire. Well, why was Paul gathering sticks and gathering fuel if the people had built the fire? Well, the people had built the fire, but Paul knew in order to keep the fire burning, he had to do his part to sustain it. You see, the, the church does its part, and it gets the fire moving, gets the fire going. But if you don't have a prayer life, the fire dwindles down. If you don't have a worship life, the fire dwindles down. You can't just come to church on Sunday mornings and praise God and worship God and not have a prayer time at home. You can't come to church and pr sing praises on, on Sunday morning and, and then listen to, and which there's nothing, I, I ain't going to go there. But you got to have a worship time at home. Put it in your truck. Put it in your car. One of the biggest blessings I got, I come to church one Sunday and Chad said, I was listening to you preach on the way to church. I was like, man, I've made it to the big time. Turn the page. There we go. I'm going to do this, and that way she can just keep up with me. Let me do this. All right. Here we go. Turn this like this. All right. Serpents. You see, the fire brought out the serpent. This one's a little touchy. You see, the serpent was already there. The serpent was already in the sticks. He was already in that. He had been there. He was comfortable, but it was cold. But Paul gathered him up and he took him. Yeah, there you go. I told you, I've never, I don't do, I've never done this before. I don't know how you do it. But anyway, he gathered it up. The snake was already there. He goes and the snake didn't bother him. It didn't even touch him, it didn't hiss at it, it didn't do anything but when he got it close to the fire and he put it on the fire the fire woke the snake up and the snake struck uh, you know where I'm going, I can tell by the look on your face see snakes can't hang around the fire Serpents can't hang around the fire. When, a snake, when snakes are cold, they don't cause trouble or expose themselves. They are dormant. You ever seen people that never open their mouth in church, but you let the fire of God fall, and boy, they all of a sudden become vocal? Moving right along. When they get close to the fire, they come alive and they become deadly. Well, I wouldn't have put that color carpet down. I wouldn't have painted the walls that color. I've seen churches split over some of the craziest things. I don't like chandeliers. We should have just done track lighting. The preacher preached too long. The praise band had too much distortion in the guitars. I'm just joking. But you see what I'm saying? The snakes don't expose themselves to the fire comes. And then we see that Paul was bit. He wasn't bit until the fire got hot. Snakes can't handle the heat. You let a man of God get up and start preaching the word of God and, and snakes will come out. Why? Because they can't stand the heat. It ain't some of this limp wrist, oh, it's our best day today. Come on, this is the... I ain't going to go there either. Um, all that uh, positive stuff. So every now and then you've got to have some meat. When I was a baby in Christ, I drank milk. But now that I'm not a baby in Christ, i got to have some meat. I love milk. I go through a gallon a week just about it. Two percent. But you know what? 
Every now and then, I just got to have a steak. I want some chicken. Give me some roast. Give me some pork chops, man. I don't like tofu and I don't like rabbit food and all that stuff. Man, give me some meat. I'm a carnivore. Fire will expose their true nature. You want to know? I told them this morning, I said, you know, I said, all these people, you know, they get up and they shut that up, and then they run, they jump, and they hop pews. That's all great. But you truly want to know who somebody is, let the fire of God fall, and their true nature will be exposed. Because what's on the inside will come out. Why? Because the fire exposes the true nature that's on the inside. See, I can put on a pilot uniform, and I can tell you that I'm an F-16 fighter pilot. I can't even talk plain. A fighter pilot, and you make you believe me. Look at there. That 20 I gave him worked. But, uh, yeah, I'm broke. But anyway... But anyway, what I'm saying is, hey, but you put me behind the, the stick and you put me in the cockpit of a plane and I'm as, loose, I, I, I'm as lost as a goose in a snowstorm. Why? Because it's not my nature. And you let somebody who has a head, full, a head full of God but not a heart full of God and you let the fire of God fall, it will expose that they're not truly who they are. Well, moving along. A church that, well... A, ch a church that's cold will be a breeding ground for serpents. A church that's cold will be a breeding ground for serpents. I told him this morning, I said, you know what? I said, when a, when, a, when a snake has a baby, it doesn't have just one. If you ever kill a snake and she's pregnant, you cut her open, there'll be many baby snakes that come out. And you know what's so interesting about snakes? It doesn't matter if it's six foot long, eight foot long, or a mopper-headed copper wakasin. That's trademark too. They're, those are poisonous. But did you know that even though those babies are so small, they're even more poisonous than the mother? And the reason why is because the mom knows how to control how much venom she puts in. You didn't catch it. The mama snake, she'll put just enough venom in to get what she wants. Them babies will hit you and they'll kill you. They put everything they've got into you. Why? Because they learn it from their mother. Well, moving right along. Not only will fire bring out the snakes, but fire brings out bugs. You ever been sitting by a fire? I know I can, look at, I can look at your face and some of you are going, where in God's name is he getting all this stuff? You ever been sitting by a fire and the smoke of that fire come around, it may choke you, but there's no bugs. But when the smoke is gone and the fire is burning clean, what happens? Bugs come. The reason why there's no bugs I say this one. The reason why there's no bugs is because in the temple, what was the smoke representing? Incense of prayers. Anytime that smoke is circling around, it's keeping the bugs away because the prayers are coming through. I know it is. I appreciate that. <laughs> there is... Bugs and mosquitoes are attracted to the fire. I told my wife that, and she was like, I don't think that's right. I said, well, I'm the one who gets bit, and you don't, so trust me, I know. <laughs> Bugs come out, and they come to the fire. They only come out for three things. They come out to bite you, they come out to annoy you, or they come out to drain or suck the blood out of you. You see, when they bite you, it doesn't kill you, it just hurts. And see, there's people in the church, there's bugs in the church. When the fire comes, see, they'll, they'll rise up and they'll bite you and they'll say stuff. It don't kill you, but it hurts. And it causes you to have hurt. And it causes you to drift away. And next thing you know, you're sitting at the house. 
Not only that, but you see that it come, they come to annoy you. Have you ever been to, uh, and, and flies come flying around, and you're doing this and that, and these little bitty gnats, little bitty gnats, they're all swarming around, and you're trying to get them out. Hey, I just smell too good, and they come to me. I don't know. They annoy you. They'll rise up in the church, and they'll annoy you in the church. And lastly, hey, they drain you. They suck you. And what that is is they'll say, you know what, I'm not going to consecrate myself to a point to where I have fire, but I'm going to get close enough to you to where I can suck off of your fire. I'm going to get close enough to you to where the fire you have, maybe it'll pour onto me, and I'll take your fire and my fire and put them together, and because I have none, I will drain you. There was ten virgins in the Bible. Five were wise. Five were foolish. Five of them had their lamps trimmed and burning and had plenty of oil. Five of them didn't have any oil, but they had their lamps. They had an appearance. They had an appearance. They had the appearance of being ready, but they had no oil. Whenever the call came out that the bridegroom was coming, what did they do? They rose up and they got with the ones who had the oil and was ready to go and they said, give me some of your oil. Give me some of your oil. I know you're ready. I know you've got that fire, but I don't have any. I know it looks like I do, but I don't. Give me some of your fire. And what did they tell them? Nope. So they left and went to get their own oil. By the time they got back, he, the bridegroom had came. They were gone, and those five were left behind. This morning, Chad, one of the saddest things is there's more people sitting in church this morning that are going to hell than people truly realize. Because in their minds, they remember an experience they had, or they remember something that mom and daddy told them, or they remember something that grandma and grandpa said, or they had this religious experience but they never truly accepted Christ as their Savior, and they're going to die on a church pew and go to hell believing the whole time they're going to heaven. That's sad. Very sad. Last, last, last slide. Not only does fire bring out the snakes and bring out the bugs, but fire will always bring an anointing. The Bible said, can we go back? Okay, there you go. The Bible said he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Fire. Fire burns out the bad growth inside you. There's a lot of people, I had to realize one of them was me that has a lot of bad things on the inside. You know, you ever been hurt and you hold on to things? Yeah. Oh, man, I'm telling you. I had to get over the mentality of, if you ever do me wrong, I'm done with you and I write you off. I, I, I have a huge heart. I pour my heart out, and I get hurt so many times because I try to help people. I try to, I try to be there, and it gets ripped out. Am I the only one? And it puts a lot of bitterness and it puts a lot of anger on the inside. But I had to realize, hey, if I truly want that fire, I've got to let that burn out. And fire, when it comes, it burns out all the bad growth. It will expose. What does light do? Light exposes a dark place. Fire will expose the darkness that we have on the inside. It will expose those things that we know about, but it will also expose those things that we don't know about. And it will burn it out. When it burns it out, fire always causes seed to grow. Whenever you have brush fires in the mountains, it will burn out all that bad vegetation. But the seeds that are there, it, the heat will cause that seed to pop and fall on the ground. And you'll have tender new growth that grows back up. That's what happens when the fire of God hits you, hits me, hits our church. 
we'll have what's not supposed to be here burn out and we'll have seeds pop and fall in fertile ground and tender honor, tender mercy, tender grace, tender fire from God will be encapsulated in this place. Fire always makes for fertile ground. Fertile ground. My grandpa, when he used to garden, he would take all summer long or all winter and he'd put all of the brush in this one spot, keep piling it on. It'd be as high as this roof. And then he'd go get five gallons of diesel fuel. He'd say, boy, it ignites a whole lot slower than gas. Whatever. I feel the same way, baby. But he'd pile it up, pile it up, clippings, leaves, grass, everything. And then when it got to where it was starting to rot, he would take and pour that diesel fuel. He'd burn all that down. And then he'd take his tractor with his cutting har and he'd roll that ash into the dirt. Became fertile ground. You see what happens when the fire of God moves in. It burns out all that. And then God takes that ash from what he's burnt out and he takes a Holy Ghost tractor, if you want to say per se, and he turns all that under and he makes it fertile so things can grow on the inside of you. You want more of God? Well, get that ground fertile and he'll deliver. Fire always brings new beginnings. Always brings new beginnings. As a deer hunter, I love hunting what's called clear cuts. It's where they've went in and they've cut all the trees out and then they'll burn it and then it just grows back this big thick mess. But see, woman, but you see, that fire brought, by, brought about new beginnings. You see, it's just a big thick mess right now, but in five or six years, there's trees that start growing. And as those trees start to grow and they get bigger, the shade from them trees start to kill out all the undergrowth underneath. And it becomes very fertile. So this morning, do you want the fire of God?